So kia ora kato, nā mai hari mai. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to this month's um, EHF Live Investor Session. Um, Edmund Hillary Fellowship, as a few of you actually now know, is a collective of entrepreneurs and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, this informal session, uh, just to clarify, Aaron is actually a, a hybrid. He is actually an entrepreneur and an investor fellow. So um, it's great that we've actually got a investor that has actually been out there and done it. It's, it's really awesome. So the interview today is done in a way that you should be able to leave the 60 minutes and know a little bit about Aaron as a person, as opposed to just what he wants to invest in and do, and also feel connected enough that you can actually um, contact him directly and he will respond back to you. So it's a, it's a warm, informal session and that you can take this information out to the people that you actually work with directly. So um, Aaron Bird, he is from Penza. It's a little um, organization, I'll let him explain what it does, but they only kind of invest in a three um, organizations at a time and they build them up. But I'll let Aaron talk about that. But firstly, we're obviously recording. So if you don't want your face on the screen, um, then just put your beautiful avatar up instead and stay muted unless you're gonna ask a question. There'll be heaps of time for Q&A and because it's a small group, you can unmute and ask those questions. Or if you want to, you can just pop them in the chat and I can um, ask those on your behalf. But um, first off, Erin, um, just tell us a little bit about who you are as a person and what made you sort of join EHF. Uh, yeah, um, maybe I'll start with me a little bit and then I'll talk about the New Zealand connection on EHF. Uh, I, uh, I've, I've kind of known I was going to be an entrepreneur my whole life uh, um, when I was, uh, my parents have like funny stories when I was a little kid, like when I was. When I was in eighth grade, I used to order pizza to our school um, and sell slices of pizza. And, and, uh, and so I would come home with like, you know, with my bag lunch that my mom would pack, uh, having not eaten anything because I'd eaten pizza. And then I had like money in my pocket selling uh, slices. And uh, well, I went to Mexico and I was like 14 with my family for two weeks and like traded jewelry amongst the merchants and stuff. So anyway, um, I've kind of always known that I was going to, I was going to be an entrepreneur and um, and started my career as like a computer scientist and um, software developer and, um, and then eventually started my first company um, about um, 10 years ago. Um, and uh, on the personal side, uh, I've got um, a family, two sons, a two-year-old and a five-year-old. Um, and, uh, and my wife actually has a lot of connectivity to New Zealand, um, which is kind of how we first started um, you know, the, the EHF process. Um, uh, my wife visited New Zealand when she was a, a kid and her best friend moved to New Zealand. And so she went and visited her and, uh, and so had this like strong connection. And her parents actually, my, my wife's parents lived in um, Australia for a little while as well. And so um, my first trip to New Zealand was uh, uh, about a year and a half ago. So actually right before COVID hit. Um, we went to New Zealand for two months. Um, so we went starting December of, uh, was it 2019 through the end of January in 2020. Um, and, uh, and my wife had obviously been a lot, but it was my first trip and we just really liked it. And um, we were kind of a, we at a phase in our life where we had, we had been talking about maybe living abroad for a while. And we had done a lot of traveling in 2019. And, um, and so, you know, as part of that, we like New Zealand so much that I started looking into like, what are the options of spending more time there, or getting a visa or permanent residency and found EHF. And it happened to be aligned with kind of right when the cohort seven and eight applications were happening. So I applied. And so that was kind of the genesis of the, the connection. And um, we're obviously in the US right now and excited to get back into New Zealand and spend some time there um, yeah. with the borders and everything. But ironically, we left in January, January 28th, um, so like COVID had hit, like, and we knew it was in Wuhan and it was actually in the US, but I think it hadn't been reported yet or something, but we left New Zealand. We left, you know, the best country in the world to be in for COVID and came to arguably the worst, although maybe there's some newer countries that are worse, but definitely a, a top three worst country. So uh, anyway, we've lamented about that a lot over the last year and a half. Maybe we should have just stayed in New Zealand. 
Yeah, right. You cannot look backwards, can you? But you can look forward. Yeah. And the thing yeah, is, exactly. you've been doing so much work with um, the SAS community and New Zealand companies um, from afar. It's been amazing what you've actually done without having to come back into the country. So three areas that we're going to look at with Aaron today. Obviously, he's a SAS guru, right? So we can have lots of questions. You can ask him as much as you want there. And he's really willing to um, add a lot of value and connections and help you out in that way. That's his kind of big offer at the end of this session. He's willing to help as many companies and that is sort of in his wheelhouse. Um, another area that he's in is crypto. So this is an area that he's exploring and, uh, and then also carbon. So he's got Tim on the call here from Energy Bank that he is working with as well. So those are three of his hot areas. So tell us a little bit about your SAS experience so that people who don't know you can actually get the full sort of breadth of where your skills lie in that area. Yeah, um, so I've been you know, building software in the cloud for whatever the last 20 years or so. Uh, um, I was a developer for a while and managed development teams um, and, uh, and actually switched over to the product side of the world when I took a job at Microsoft in 2007, and which was what moved me to Seattle. Um, and uh, I left Microsoft in 2011 to start a company called Visible. Um, and so, we did marketing attribution. So again, it was a SaaS product uh, for marketing teams to measure the efficacy of their marketing. Um, and uh, so I started that company and ran it um, for about eight years and then sold it to Marketo. Um, and then I spent about a year and a half at Marketo running global product there. Um, so I basically, I've been in the SaaS kind of world for a long time and I've been building in the cloud for a long time. And I think, um, you know, the big, the big takeaway for me, particularly coming out of an engineering background, uh, is that in, in, in B2B, um, it's really, the main thing is about go-to-market, right? So I think there's a lot of great products out there, but I think that the winners end up being the ones that win on the go-to-market side. Um, and as an as a engineer and a product person at heart, that kind of hurts me to say, because I always feel like, you know, the best products should always win. And, um, uh, and that's what I that's what I believe should be the, the case, but it's, it ends up not necessarily being the case in the marketplace. So, um, so anyway, that's something I quickly learned, uh, you know, running Visible, and so spent probably the last you know ten or fifteen years like really going deep on the, the go to market side and like how do how do companies go to market? Um, what are the different models and and how can you win there? Um, I was also really fortunate at Visible. And at Marketo, um, we worked with kind of the world's best B2B marketers because um, we were selling into them. We helped them do marketing at Marketo and help them measure marketing and visible. And so, um, you know, not only kind of did I learn a lot from the experience of running visible, but also I got to network with just some amazing go-to-market folks and, and got to see what works, you know, whether you're selling to the enterprise or SMB or um, kind of different motions. And so um, I think that that's the that's the area where I think I can help the most. Um, and I think it's the area where early stage um, software companies need the most help is around go to market and distribution and how do you scale? Because uh, again, most of them, most of the founders have that kind of product DNA and they, they know what they need to build and, and, you know, but it's how do they, how do they get the, how do they distribute that and get it out there cost effectively and stuff. So that's where I've, um, I've done about 70 or so angel investments um, over like the last 10 years. And um, that's, you know, what I found is especially in early stage companies, the place I can help the most is, is just kind of go to market, um, both like the strategy and even like also recruiting and how do you hire great people. Cool. Um, Anna's just put a question here. Um, what was your biggest challenge at Visible? And, and then she's got in brackets, I love a good failure story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. Um, yeah, I, I think I made a lot of mistakes uh, and, and um, learned a lot from them. Um, I think the, the, I stumbled a lot um, hiring the right sales leader. Uh, I actually, um, you know, I hired and had to let go two different sales leaders. Um, and, and on the third one was kind of the, the right one. But that took, I mean, honestly, it was a span of three or four years. Uh, and um, I think if you, if you, you know, I came again out of an engineering background. And so if, you, if you're a salesperson or you're a sales leader, you know what sales leaders look like. But as an engineer, I did not, right? This was the first time 
that I had really interacted much with with sales and marketing was was one invisible. And so I think the um, it took me a while to figure out that profile. Um, you know, even kind of mediocre salespeople are are still good at selling themselves, and so it's hard it's hard to kind of sift through the noise um, and do that recruiting, or at least it really was for me. And so um, that was a challenging area, and and quite honestly, it, it affected the business. Like we, um, you know, we ended up doing well and and got growth back on track after I got the right leader. But there was kind of this middle part of the company where we were. Um, you know, growth started to slow and it was all because we didn't have the right leadership in place on the sales side. And so I think that was something that was really hard. And I see other early stage companies struggle with this, particularly when the founders come out of a product or engineering background, because it's, it's, it, it's hard. Um, and I definitely, you know, hopefully not everybody stumbles twice like I did in grow, but uh, that was, that was tough. Thank you. That's really good to hear actually. And it is a, something that does happen a lot with the New Zealand SaaS companies and I think it's sometimes it's almost like lack of people in the market or who you know like if lots of people are recommending people and it's not necessarily the right fit so tell us a little bit more about Penza what what's your intention with that firm because it's a really different model that you've got going on there yeah like you said it's kind of a hybrid between investor and entrepreneur and so um I've raised a little bit of capital um and and the plan is to to be very focused and do maybe, you know, three companies over the next five years, uh, and um, and not just invest, but also spend a lot of time, obviously, uh, with each of them. So we started our first company uh, at the end of last year called Inflection, and so I'm spending a lot of time right now on that. Um, and uh, you know, and we'll start probably one more company in the next year or two. Um, and uh, we can either get involved with founders or a very, very early stage where we can actually start the company um, as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's kind of like just my time and capital with a very, very concentrated approach. So it's, it's very different than kind of the venture model of, of making lots of bets. So describe some characteristics then of what kind of founder you'd be looking for, like, because it's obviously a deep commitment. That and the risk is, is shared is quite high. So what are you looking for then in the type of company or founder that you'd take into this program? Yeah, I think, um, so very early stage um, where I think I can help the most. Um, and then something most likely B2B SaaS is gonna be the area that, that PNs is gonna add the most value. Um, and, and going after a big market. Um, I think is the the other one. Um, but those are, that's kind of the criteria. But I personally can engage with folks in lots of different ways. So I can write angel checks to, uh, or I can just help. And so, you know, my my model with New Zealand so far has been just to meet with as many people as possible, um, and and see where I can be helpful. And so I've, I've done lots of calls, and um, um, I'm getting close to maybe joining the board of advisors for a company. But I think. Um, and I've written some some checks. In fact, invested in Tim's company, Energy Bank. Um, I'm not at all an expert in uh, uh, ocean energy storage, but excited to be on the ride and hopefully could help Tim a little bit with fundraising like that. So, um, but yeah, I think the you know Pienza, um, it, it because we're doing so few, like the engagement is very selective, and it, you know it's got to be kind of the perfect fit. But I think the best way. To engage with me is just to, to reach out and I'm happy to meet with folks and, and see where I could be helpful. And maybe that's a small angel track, or maybe that's something, you know, more kind of a deeper engagement with Pienza. Um, um, but would love to, to talk to early stage folks in, in New Zealand. So just gonna go deeper on that. I just want a little bit more detail on is it are there verticals that you wouldn't go down, or are there particular verticals that Penza would be really interested in like just to sort of give people an idea yeah. otherwise you might get like a hundred of these things coming at you and you straight away know that those aren't in your wheelhouse yeah I think b2b SaaS and then like crypto nfts those would be the two areas that um that I'm the most engaged in um I have a passion for kind of carbon stuff which um you know so I've written a few angel checks there but I think that if you know to kind of think about two verticals I think b2b SaaS and then um, kind of things around crypto or NFTs are the, the areas that, that I can probably, you know, I'm the most interested in talking to folks. Cool. Do we have any questions from the floor? If you want to start thinking of some, or if you want to put your hands up, um, 
we can go, we can start doing that now. Um, so with the, you've already spent quite a bit of time um, looking at the New Zealand um, SAS market with Callaghan. So you, you participated in a couple of the workshops there. So the actual founder one and I think, or the investor one and the director one. So just sort of give us a little bit of a um, feedback on how you felt that process went and what learnings that came out of it for you about the New Zealand SAS market. Yeah, um, well, I think first of all, kind of that thing we were talking about uh, while, we were, while people were gathering, I, you know, coming from the US, it just is really refreshing how much I don't know, the government in New Zealand is, is like actually you know, actively helping, right? So um, with Callahan and all this other stuff, I, I just think it's great. Um, so I think one takeaway for me was just that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of effort and resources to, and genuine interest to help companies, um, especially early stage companies, which is, which is great. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge, you know, New Zealand, like any ecosystem. So I, I live in Seattle, for example. And so I've watched, you know, the Seattle ecosystem, the startup ecosystem grow um, over the last 15 years. Um, and it's kind of an extension of Silicon Valley, but it's still, you know, in, a, in and of itself, its own physical ecosystem. And I think New Zealand is a lot like, you know, Seattle kind of, um, uh, you know, a few years ago or something, right, where it's still growing. And I think uh, most I think there's a kind of a playbook and I think Brad Feld and the Foundry folks have, have written a lot about this, um, but you know, there's a few kind of key pieces that you need for an ecosystem to grow. And, and one of the biggest ones is talent, right? And, just, and not just lots of developers and lots of technical talent, but, but also senior talent. Like you know, we talked about hiring the wrong VP of sales, right? And so how do you, how do you know what the right one looks like and how many are there and, and you know, how many of them are recruitable and stuff like that. So, um, I think that's, you know, and, and that there's nothing new there. That's not, it's not that insightful, like, Hey, we need more great talent and more great senior talent. But, uh, I think the more, um, New Zealand can do to attract those folks and, um, you know, the, the faster that will help kind of snowball, um, the, the ecosystem. Mm. So Dave has um, asked this sort of question, which I was hoping to sort of get more from you as well, actually, Aaron, is on the B2B SaaS, because it's pretty broad, right? Are there any particular areas that are of interest to you? Honestly, I mean, I think any, uh, I'm spending a lot of time on companies that, that are leveraging product-led growth as a motion. So, so companies, for example, that have, um, a free trial or a free version of their product where the product itself is a important part of the funnel or an important part of their go-to-market strategy. I'm spending a lot of time there, um, but I think I can be helpful for any, any you know, SaaS company that's selling to a business because in the end, there's only a few kind of go-to-market motions or, or ways to go to market that, that can work. Uh, and and you know, regardless if you're selling to uh, you know, kind of solo entrepreneur accountants, or you're selling to the Fortune 500. Um, you know, it, it uh, across you know market size, or across company size, or industry. Um, you know, there, it's really there's just a few ways to do it, and so I think I can be helpful. If you're selling to a consumer, it's a little bit different. You know, so B two C, I think is, um, you know, maybe not as much my expertise, unless you know. If you're selling to a, uh, an accountant that's a, you know, a, a, a one person show, uh, it might look more like a B2C, but in the end you're selling to a, a business. So um, yeah, I think any, anything really, any B2B SaaS, I, I can be helpful and um, regardless of kind of the industry or the, the target customer. Mm, okay, so that kind of answers Sue's question going there. She's like, how tolerant are you of any B2C aspects of a B2B gig? <laughs> yeah. I think as long as most B2C ends up being not as monetized, right? So if you're selling a product or if you're, if you're going to market and advertising is your business model, then it's, I'm probably not a good fit. Um, uh, or at least I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be less helpful. If in the case of like Dropbox, you're selling a service, right? That someone pays for to a consumer. Um, I guess that's where it gets a little blurry. Uh, but if you're if you're selling SaaS on a subscription basis, 
which ends up being mostly B2B. And I think that's that's a really good fit for me. Mm, good. I like it how you're very clear about what you can and cannot do. It's, that's actually very useful because when, you know, last thing that um, people need is to kind of like, oh gosh, you know, you're not my right person. So it's great. So Anna has got a question here. You talked about helping companies hire good people. So what are the top tips for hiring well, especially sales folk? that's top of mind for Anna at the moment? Yeah. Um, I think one thing that really helped me uh, was this, this idea of, of kind of building a prototype in your mind um, of going and talking to a bunch of people that are the right fit, but maybe you, even if you can't recruit them, right? So I think um, like one thing I did with, with the, the sales hire um, I leveraged my network through investors I had and, and more senior folks to just have conversations with great VPs of sales, um, even though you know, I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to recruit them at the time. But the more you kind of talk to those folks, and I would ask them questions like, how, you know, how should I hire a VP of sales? How would you interview a VP of sales if you were me, right? And, and the more you, you meet and talk to people that are, that are the right fit, even if you're not going to be able to get them yet, uh, the more you'll start to be able to kind of picture who the right person is and, and do a better job interviewing. So, um, so I think that's one thing. I think the, the, for sales specifically, the stage of the company um, and the size of the, or the, the complexity of the deal are two really important kind of metrics when hiring a, a sales leader or even a salesperson. So as a specific example, um, you know, one mistake I made is I thought, you know, I want the VP of sales or the head of sales at Salesforce, right? Like that person knows how to do sales. But the reality is at a seed stage or a series A stage company, that person actually would not be a good head of sales. They would fail miserably um, because they're used to having a ton of support. Like they've got a whole product marketing team that's going to give them content and sales decks. And, you know, they, they're used to being able to go hire salespeople, uh, and pay them, you know, the highest market rate, uh, and, and all this kind of stuff that you can't do at an early stage company. And so, I think um, for a sales leader, finding somebody who's gone through, like whatever you're going to go do for the next 24 months, find someone that that is in a recent rearview mirror, right? That they just went from half a million of revenue to to 20 million of revenue at some company uh, that that looks similar to you, and you know, and now they want to go do it again. Because what you also find is that those those sales leaders, um, they know what they're good at too, right? And so um, they typically, they'll get to a point and they'll want to go do that same thing again. And that next phase is, probably, is likely not going to be the right phase for them. And so you can find those people, um, you know, right at, you know, when they're ready to leave. Uh, and, and, and you might think, oh, well, why would they leave this company that's doing 20 million a year to come to my seed stage company? Well, they might do that because they want to go you know, they, they figured out they're good at that. And they want to go do it again. So the stage of the company matters a lot because the amount of resources available and kind of, um, you know, not really having product market fit yet and a sales leader that can kind of navigate those waters, um, I think is really important. And then the deal size is, and, and, and deal complexity is really important. So um, if, you, if you're selling a deal that's, you know, $20,000 a year, and it takes, you know, on average 90 days to close the sale. Um, you want to get both salespeople and sales leaders that have done something similar. So, you know, if they were a sales leader selling 200K deals that, that was a nine month sales cycle, it's going to be hard for them to adjust to that faster sales cycle and, and smaller deals. And then also the other extreme, you know, if they were, if they were working on like a, a boiler room of one call closes of 1K deals, um, it's going to be hard for them to stretch up to, to your like 10K deal size. So, I think that that's important. And I think that's even more important than the industry. So this is again, another mistake I made where I was like, oh, I need some, a sales leader and salespeople that really understand MarTech because that's what we're selling is marketing technology. And the reality is that's not, that didn't matter what the deal size and the, the stage of the company and repeating those profile um, kind of fits for um, salespeople ended up working a lot better than than, than knowing MarTech. Um, a good salesperson can sell, you know, just about anything. It won't take them long to, to at least come up to speed enough on the domain 
uh, to, to go sell it. So those are, those are two things that again, like, I, you know, I've got scar tissue to, to, to for the, for the wounds on, on figuring that out, but um, that, that's something that I would focus on. So Aaron, just to um, expand on that just a little bit. One thing we have obviously is New Zealand companies are often hiring the person in the US. So Ken, who's based down in Dunedin, big shout out Matt. Um, what is the sort of package that a lead US salesperson would want? What would they be looking for? So it does depend on the stage too, but let's let's assume you're, uh, you know, you're you're generating revenue, but you're still south of you know five million of ARR or something like that. Um, so you're kind of like seed stage or A stage. Um, I it it's hard. Like the problem is they make a lot of money first of all, um, and there's just not a lot around that. Like you, it's, it's hard to get around that. Um, I think you can get uh sales leaders for you know call it 250 to 300,000 US all in um and that's usually 50-50 base and variable so if they're making 300k it's a 150 base and a 150 variable and the variable is tied to obviously the sales results and this is a vp of sales that you know could could get you to 10 or 20 million um, of ARR, uh, and then you know, hopefully they keep going from there. But um, if not, then you, I think you, you know, it's done well and it was worth it. And they're usually getting about one percent um, in equity. It could be, depending on the stage, it could be more, a little more, a little less. Like I could see three quarters of a point up to like two percent, something like that, depending on the stage. Um, and you know, one thing I always like to do, anyone I hire, whether it's a leader, individual contributor, whatever, I have like a sliding scale of. On one side there's cash comp and on the other side there's equity and you tell me like where you want to fit right you can trade off cash comp for equity and i think um so you know maybe you get a sales leader that's two hundred thousand all in and you give them a little bit more equity if if you um you know if you can't uh if you can't afford it um so i think you've got to be at the right stage to do that obviously like you um, i think most SaaS companies are you know the the the, the ceo has been doing sales they've hired maybe one or two um, account executives, like individual contributors, salespeople that are doing well. And I think that's a good time to bring in like a VP of sales. So it's, you know, you obviously you can't afford 300,000 um, when there's just, there's just five of you kind of figuring it out. Like the, the, the CEO has got to be doing the selling at that point. Mm, really interesting. Um, and I can see I, when you actually said that number, I saw a lot of people's faces go ouch because it's way more than everyone else would be earning. So yeah. 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 So yeah, it is, yeah, you know, they're, like they're, that's it, right? Yeah, the sales people the most, earning more sure. than the CEOs. Oh, um, yeah, just, for sure. I mean, I think one thing too, look, if that person that you're paying 300000 they could get a job making 600 at, you know, a Series C company. Um, now, they're not going to get as much equity, um, you know, not nearly as much equity. And so that's the trade off. Um, but great salespeople make you know, can make a lot. I mean, even that sales leader could go be an IC salesperson and make like a million a year at, um, you know, at like a snowflake or something like that. So um, it, you, you have to pay up to, to get great folks. And sales is probably the most extreme example of that. Mm. So just gonna go back to Nina's question. So what's the biggest problem, issue or mistake you see with the go-to-market strategies um, in New Zealand SaaS companies? Hmm. I don't, how about this? I would say that I don't think there's anything in the go-to-market strategy, um, telling about what's unique. Uh, I think what, one hard thing about New Zealand, um, it, it's a, it, like everything, it's, it's a pro and a con, right? So one thing that's great about being in a market of 5 million people um, is that you quickly start thinking about how do I scale? Right. Um, how how do I leave New Zealand in my go to market? Um, in the U.S., companies get to like a hundred million a year and don't even think about international, right? And so, um, I think that's a good thing because it it you get this scale mindset early in New Zealand um, and thinking about other markets. I think the challenge is that it can also mean that you get a little distracted. So, um, I think you know focus is is your is so important in early stage companies. And um, 
so I think like, you know, going New Zealand, Australia, you know, a couple of countries in Europe and looking at the US, all of a sudden you're in, you know, five, eight markets um, with, you know, each is gonna need their own go to market resources and stuff. So I think that can be challenging. Um, and so I think thinking early about what is your strategy around markets and, and are you just gonna jump to the US and it's like New Zealand, US and that's it? Or are you gonna go kind of New Zealand, Australia gets a five or 10 million there and then, and then kind of go further out. But I think I've seen some companies get a little distracted early. Um, and so I think that's, you know, and again, it, the benefit is that you think about scaling and you think about localization and, and currencies and all these things a lot earlier. Um, but it also means that maybe you can get distracted and end up in too many markets too fast. Cool. So the so one here from Neville, Aaron. Um, so what does early stage mean to you? Because um, is it going to be sort of go to market model and scale? Or because most of the New Zealand companies are still trying to get the um, product market fit nailed. And obviously with your engineering background, is there a preference? Um, I think it can be helpful for both, but probably if you've got some good early signs of product market fit, um, you don't have to have that much revenue, but um, I think having a strong thesis about the product and the market and like why it's unique and who the customer is. Because uh, again, I think Earlier than that, it's really a, you know, the help needed is around product. And, um, you know, I'm not a product expert in all of the industries and verticals, right? So I think it, it might, my help there can get a lot more, I guess, narrow, more narrow focus. Um, so I think having, having a good thesis around product market fit and, you know, some early customers. Um, and then, you know, early stage, I'd say goes up all the way up to like 5 million, something like that of ARR. Um, so kind of, you know, one dollar up to, to five million maybe is the, the range. I love this question. For, you know, what's the weirdest company you've invested in or worked with? <laughs> this is definitely going to be a story there. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I don't know. What's the weirdest? Uh, I mean, like I wouldn't. So Tim's on the call <laughs> from Energy Bank. I wouldn't describe it as weird. So I don't want to like come across this. I don't call energy bank weird, but it's definitely the most unusual. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's a team of, of less than 10 taking on the energy storage market, uh, you know, through deep, deep ocean energy storage. So I think that's, uh, I like the, you know, there's just a huge vision and it's just such a crazy idea. Um, so I think I might have to go with that. Although I'll go on record as not calling it weird, but just calling it maybe unusual or, uh, or <laughs> kind of far out there. Um, Absolutely. If anyone wants to unmute <laughs> and ask questions, please do as well. Don't feel you need to put them in the chat. Lily? Uh, kia ora koutou. Hopefully you can hear me because I've just had my teeth at the dentist done. So. Hopefully I don't lisp too much. Uh, kia ora, Aaron. Just a quick question. Um, look, I work with uh, many Māori businesses um, where we're building um, tenoranga tiratanga, self-empowerment through enterprise, through creating our own uh, businesses. One of the dilemmas, and I'll be really upfront with you here and to see what your thoughts might be, um, many of our, in particular, Māori businesses um, almost... Uh, have a fear for the VCs and investors at the moment, because what tends to happen is that it's almost like an extraction mentality, that that the investors are coming to the Garden of Eden now, you know, New Zealand is a good place to be, uh, but it's almost like um, grabbing the All Blacks, grabbing the ones that have all already made it through, taking them out to scale, which, which, which yes, that's a good thing, we, we, we need that, but where the dilemma lies is at the beginning stages, there are many marvellous grassroots businesses, great, um, more and more um, software developers. And so what, how we operate is more in the relationship building mentality initially. So in other words, you've got to create the juniors first, help nurture the juniors, get the water bottle, pass the oranges before they help work for them to get to that all black status because then the trust is built so that you're not just about extraction 
scaling and it's not all about the bottom line it's also about the impact that those investments create so have you had any issues with that or, or is there how, how might i quell our people um to, to show that it's not just about extraction yeah i think the so um is your is it about how to kind of attract investors and and help or um, or maybe help me understand a little bit more about the so, so yeah, Aaron, a little bit more about um, the giving. So what is it that you rather than traditional VCs that are coming in and they want that exit pretty quickly and taking a lot of stuff off the table with them so that they are maximizing the benefit as opposed to the actual founders? and the community that have come around the Māori businesses or the community. And so it's what in your um, realm in New Zealand would you be doing to help out? And yeah, what's your sort of intention there? Yeah, um, well, I think like I, I always come from all these things as just a like a help first, you know? So um, I think Anybody I talk to, uh, any entrepreneur I meet with, it's always just like, let's let's have a couple of conversations and let me see if I can be helpful. Um, I think that's the, the right first step for anything. Um, so, I mean, I think there, and I think a lot of um, folks in EHF and a lot of like mentors and investors come from that too. So I think, you know, maybe leveraging that and just trying to get as much help from, from different folks as possible um, might be, uh, I don't know if that's the answer, if that answers your question or not, but. Um, Lily's a fellow, Aaron, I should have said that at the very beginning. Yeah, Lily's a, a fellow from, might, yeah. not even, might even be your cohort. Yeah. Six, cohort six. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions? Any other points, Aaron, that you want to actually get across to the room? Um, no, I think I'm, you know, I'm excited to meet with as many, uh, kind of early stage entrepreneurs as possible. And so, um, particularly in like SaaS and crypto, like we talked about. So I think that, um, I've been doing as much as I can from afar and trying to like network with, with, uh, you know, smart folks and connected folks. And so, you know, hopefully, um, what comes out of this is like, you know, I get to chat with more entrepreneurs and, and see where I can be helpful. I think that's probably my, my, uh, the biggest takeaway is just, um, I think one thing that's been been really cool that I didn't I didn't know coming into EHF and everything is just that um, there's a there's a hotbed of of vertical SaaS in New Zealand. Um, there's like a lot of for whatever reason you know there's a lot of SaaS companies focused on different verticals, and so um, uh, you know I've been meeting with a lot of those companies, and and there's probably a lot more that that I haven't talked to yet. So. Maybe that's the, the biggest takeaway is to just, you know, if you, if you have people in your network or you think of folks, like feel free to, to reach out to me and, um, you know, do as many Zoom calls and hopefully uh, get a beer at some point here in, in New Zealand with, with people in, in person. So do you want to put your um, email in the chat then for people if it's the easiest way to get in touch through or whether you prefer any other social yep. media um, ways? Well, I think email is probably the best because this group gets to know you now. Um, yep. And then and has also asked any other ways that we can help you that um, the people here in New Zealand can help you from afar to make it easier for you. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I, you know, I've been trying to network with with um, angel groups and folks like that. So um, like you and I talked about Serge earlier. I met with him and he was really helpful. And I met with uh, Richard Kuhn and the, the Marlboro Angels. Yeah. And so I've, you know, if you have other folks like that that maybe are not, you know, SaaS entrepreneurs, but are well connected to SaaS entrepreneurs. I'm, you know, I'm happy to meet with folks like that too. But um, just trying to get as connected as possible and and learn about the cool stuff that people are doing. And so I think that's probably my my biggest ask and my only ask. That's good, Aaron. Did everyone else? Did your email address come through? Did anyone? Did it come through? Everyone else? Oh, oh, no. sorry. Hold on. I sent it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and another question from Suze is, what's your favorite blog post or book at the moment? Um, I just read Sapiens, uh, and I really liked Sapiens. I really liked that a lot. Um, 
it's like the you know the history of of of, of humankind, I guess. Uh, and uh, I thought it was really enlightening. And um, yeah, so that's probably my 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 most recent book that I, I was excited about reading. No, that's good. And just so a lot of these people on this call are actually. Um, either investors or they are connectors into and work with a lot of those companies. So like Anna, for example, Ken, I know that's sitting there. Dave, um, who's also an investor and a connector. And Sue's obviously the chair of the Angel Association. You've got Nina up there, CEO of the Tauranga Angel Group. So there's a huge group of um, people that connect you into those other SaaS companies in New Zealand. So that would be, I think the ask for Aaron is to... Um, um, connect him with some great uh, people that he can have great, good conversations with and you yourselves feel free to ask Aaron any questions yourselves afterwards and connect with him he's actually been very very um, open and spent a lot of time with New Zealand companies from afar so we can't actually wait for him to get in and so that you can have a beer or a wine and um, yeah, it's good. And we'll get to see your, see your little boys and, and meet your wife and you can come back. So it's great. So thank you everyone for the time. And thank you, Aaron, for sharing your stories. It's, um, it's great. And it's hard when you first meet people to, to share um, from, from the heart, but it, it's great. It's good to, to know who you are. So thank you for everyone. And next we have, um, next week we have Craig McGrail, who's going to talk about a fund for uh, woman-led founders and companies so that is next week on the 18th but thanks team thank you for coming thanks Aaron thank you bye thanks, bye. Thanks, thanks everyone Aaron. thank you